it turned out that no matter where I live or where I come from, if I'm writing a hymn, I have in my mind what a hymn is supposed to be like. And that is largely influenced by the hymn traditions of Christianity. Welcome back to the For All the Saints podcast. Uh, today's very special episode with Ray Robinson. Uh, we're going to talk about the new church hymn book, which uh, I think will be very intriguing. I, I've We hear things in the church news every now and then, little updates here and there. And so uh, I'm so grateful that you, Ray, would come on and spend a bit of time with me uh, discussing it and answering some questions. So welcome. Thank you. I'm grateful to be with you, Ben. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, my first question is going back to that announcement, which I think was made in 2018 or, or end of 2017. I was on my mission at the time, <clears throat> so I remember that. But my question is, how did the idea of a new hymn book come about? And, you know, why a new hymn book and why now? Those are three questions in one, but... Yeah, I, I think the answer to that question it goes beyond my comprehension. Uh, I was I was involved in a few conversations at the time, uh, um, but it, it had been quite clear, uh, made quite clear to us as employees that uh, that the church would not be doing a new hymn book uh, for the foreseeable future, and. And we had been working on uh, what we call select, what we called selected hymns, and uh, which is a, a collection of about sixty hymns and children's songs for um, for languages that that are emerging in the church that don't have a lot of members, but uh, but it's part of the first package of of things that are translated into emerging languages. Uh, this little collection, and and we had then had been working on a on a revision of that and and that actually um, was misunderstood a little bit and so we were we were called to um, called to explain what we were doing to some of the senior leaders and and it was during that explanation that th that was the first time I he had heard well maybe this is the time to consider a, a full and book replacement. And so we were asked to do, uh, to conduct a study essentially of, of, uh, what problems exist in, in our current structure of hymn books and, uh, and come back with, a uh, with a report on wh what, what are the problems to be solved, if any, and, and uh, how would we solve them? And so, so we returned with, with a number of things that that you're familiar with, in in uh, units with multiple languages. I might uh, the, the the person conducting the meeting might say we'll we'll sing hymn number one hundred, and if I've got more than one language uh, spoken and sung in a meeting, hymn one hundred does not correspond across languages. In fact, it corresponds across none of the languages, and. Um, so that was a that was a problem that we thought we could solve. Uh, it had been it had been decades since the since the most recent hymn book had been had been considered and updated. And in that interim, there had been a number of new hymns created. Some of them were quite popular. Some new arrangements that had been created that were also quite popular. And the church had grown considerably. And and uh, the the opportunity to reflect a global church uh, was another th uh, another opportunity that we saw as as a potential and and actually at each at each uh, stage of the conversation um, it was a surprise to us and I think uh, at least to some of the leaders as they felt impressed to uh, to wrestle with the questions themselves, and the, and ultimately to direct that a new hymn book be created. That's so interesting, uh, and yeah, the the current hymn book that we have, I believe, was from 1985. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. The... I mean, 
Sorry. The current cookbook was 1985. The uh, current children's songbook um, uh, was just a few years after that. What, to what scale is the church different since then to give us an understanding of why um, this new hymn book will bless so many? I mean, uh, I wasn't around back then, but I mean, was it, was it hugely different in numbers, the church then? Oh yes, and I don't have I don't have the details close at hand, uh, but in 1985, uh, I lived in Idaho. Uh, I was a, a how old was I? I was a young man, um, either a deacon or a or a teacher, uh, and and our temple trips were were several hours away. Wow. Uh, from from where I lived, and so it was a it was a day long excursion periodically, uh, and that was, and I think we were still relatively close compared to the rest of the church. Uh, in the interim, I mean, I don't know how many temples there were at the time, but but many 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 fewer than there are today, uh, and as we all know. Uh, Peru is about to have its second temple in the city, uh, which is something that would have been un absolutely unheard of in 1985. In addition, the uh, the growth of the ch there, there are several new areas of the church since 1985. Um, yeah, it's it's the, the church has grown from from a largely centralized around utah church to to one that that um less than half the members now are native english speakers is that is that true i might have just said something that's untrue it's uh, either that or living in north america i can't remember but but it's much more it's much the church is much more globally distributed at this point yeah, that is amazing, and it you sort of it it makes you feel excited when things become more you know uh, globally focused with the church, and and you see that even with um, the last few apostles too reflecting that, and it's it's exciting when we look to perhaps the the Lord's priorities for the church and and making it more uh, open to all four corners of the earth, which is really exciting, especially as someone who served their mission in Asia where there are a lot of branches and uh, it's really cool. <laughs> we had those same struggles with hymns, uh, some funny struggles there. But, I mean, in your mind, Ray, why are the hymns such an important uh, part of our faith and our, our worship? I think I think hymns and and music are in many religions, an integral part of how we express our love for, our devotion to, our our commitment uh, and praise to God. And in our church, it's no different. Uh, we, from from the very early days of the church, uh, by by revelation and commandment, uh, uh, M.S. Smith was directed to make a collection of sacred hymns and with with the instruction uh, with the acknowledgement that the, that the song of a righteous of the righteous is a prayer unto God and and that those songs would be answered with blessings and and so many hymns were written at the time and have continued to be written uh, they've been collected from from faith traditions around the world and and it can seem sometimes like uh, like hymns are are reduced to markers in a meeting. We're beginning one. We're about at the middle of one. We're at the end of one. Uh, but but part of the um, part of the hope for the new collection is an expanded effort to help people in their homes as well as in their meetings uh, take full advantage of the power of of worship through music right i see yeah it's it's cool when you look back at our church history and 
religious history in general, but you know, when you're talking about our faith, you look at those iconic moments that we look back on that were uh, accompanied by a hymn that we now relate with. You know, the I think of Kirtland Temple and hearing them sing the Spirit of God. I I think of John Taylor singing to Joseph and Hiram in Carthage Jail. Um, and then being British myself, you know, singing those traditional Wesleyan hymns. And so it's just, uh, I love that that is such a big part of our faith. And it excites me that um, we perhaps may get an insight into this hymn book about the musical traditions of, of other cultures as well, you know. Um, but I I want to dig into the process because it sounds really interesting. Uh, and f- perhaps firstly asking what your responsibility in the uh, the new hymn book is and uh, who else is involved in it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my role as an employee is uh, director of experiences at home and church, and what uh, what that means is is that I oversee the work of a number of uh, product madden managers, subject matter experts that are all focused on different areas of member leader experience in the church. So gospel learning, uh, scriptures, music and events, uh, all, all of the, all of the ways that we think of that we're able to think of members and leaders in unique ways. Uh, if we were to call them audiences, uh, I, I play different roles as a member of the church. I'm a father, I'm a husband. I have a church calling. I might be a teacher. Uh, and, and it's in all those ways that my group thinks of people and, and tries to help support them with, with various experiences. And uh, music is one of them. The, uh, on the employee side, we have a, a small and, and at this point kind of growing team to be able to, to complete this particular project. Uh, and, and their work is overseen and participated in by um, by a called committee of of musicians and lyricists uh, and regular people who are not musical people but who can give good insights about how music works for them and they make recommendations of various kinds and those recommendations are considered first by um, by uh, general authority and general officer advisors, and and then those recommendations move from there to to a larger group of general authorities and general officers, and and then by a an executive council, which is which is led by members of the twelve and presiding bishopric and some uh, some of the uh, organization leadership uh, in the presidency of the seventy. And then it goes from there to the full quorum of the twelve, and and to the first presidency. So all uh, all of the hymns and songs that are included in the new collection will have been approved by the first presidency ultimately. Wow, yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a big amount of people as well. Uh, and you, the church put out a sort of announcement accepting uh, original hymns that you know members had written and and composed perhaps Uh, how many did you actually receive from that so there were over twenty thousand submissions uh well that that, (laughs) uh, that's a little bit overstating what actually happened there were um with some administrative work we discovered that there were a number of duplicates there were a number of submissions that were actually submissions of hymns that we already have that people just wanted to make sure we were considering. So in the end, it was around 17,000 new, fully new hymns and children's songs. And uh, those, uh, each of those were con- have been considered very carefully. Uh, the first round, so ev- so there was no submission that was not reviewed in a blind review process. So names were removed, identifiers were removed, and uh, four different experts 
reviewed each of those submissions, made recommendations, and and that process has been so so that made a reduction, and then the process was um, was repeated for new blind reviewers with a smaller group, and and so on to to move that seventeen thousand down to a to find the best of the best. And I'm I'm saying best of the best, and that's probably a misstatement as well because uh, I think for everyone who's been involved in that review process, the main impression has been the level of of really consecration and generosity and inspiration that good people throughout the world have have demonstrated in offering their music to the church and to the world. And it's, and that has been humbling for everybody involved. Uh, we of course can't make a hymn collection with 17,000. And so, uh, and, and, uh, so that's been reduced as we've gone. Uh, and in the end, there will be a very few of those that will be published in, in this book. Uh, but there'll be a few that represent the generosity and and inspired gifts of thousands. Could you give us uh, some more idea into how you uh, the the ins and outs of of dealing with a hymn? Say, I, I was reading on the church website that uh, it was at, it was really really complex because there were you know you had to check the the doctrine on a hymn, for example, it may have been a, a beautiful hymn and, and the words may have just been, oh, we need to tweak a, did you take hymns as they were? Or, you know, um, what am I trying to articulate? I, I would love to know sort of how you go from a random hymn someone sent in to that's in the hymn book. So it's probably important to acknowledge that every hymn is going through an evaluation that's similar, including the new submissions. Uh, and so the, 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 so regardless of whether the hymn's been around for a while or, or whether it's recently submitted, uh, each hymn is, and song is assessed for doctrinal clarity and correctness for, for the relevance of the, of the message, I'd say, uh, the singability, for lack of a better word, is this is this likely to be embraced and sung by people? Uh, and and if at each stage of review, if a song or hymn was was um, was assessed as as this is good, except then uh, then discussions were had and. Uh, as to what would it take to to make it uh, fully accessible, right? And so, in other words, uh, people that submitted things, their their hymns or songs would not be disqualified because of a because of a slight misstatement. Yeah, if there was a slight misstatement, but the songs otherwise, this is this is singable. It's we can we can imagine people all over the world just loving this idea, and and there's just this one little weird thing that's an that's an awkward way of saying something or whatever. We would work with that, and 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 ultimately, if it if it were to um, be uh, get get far enough along in the process that that it seemed like it was approvable, at that point. The, the names can be reattached and we can contact the artist and say, okay, we love this. There's some things that for, for it to really work for the church need some adjustment. Can we work together on this? So that's, so that's how that is working. So with, with a number of those submissions, we're at that stage and, and uh, we find that we find that people are eager to, to collaborate and and make adjustments as necessary. Is there an element too of the ability to translate it across so many languages? I, I think 
was there a plan to have uh, around 50 translations of the hymn book or at least selected hymns by 2030 or something? I mean, yeah, uh, that, that was what we published. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is curious workmanship, like in the Book of Mormon or Elder Bednar taught. Well, nobody's gone here before. And and so we are we are uh, building things that that we haven't seen before, and one of them is the translation, uh, or what we would call transcreation process, it, because songs don't work in direct translations. Uh, they uh, and so the and so what's really happening is language by language, there being a new hymn or song is being created. That is, that is based on the original submission, the original hymn, and uh, there are lots of there are lots of potential challenges with that. Uh, and and so what we have worked with with a team of very talented translators, musician, uh, lyricists in in multiple languages, uh, and and uh, consulting teams to try to develop the processes that that give us confidence that that, um, that hymns as they're published in languages can be really embraced in those languages uh, we we've had we've had example we we have a number of examples where where what has happened in the past has been a literal translation or 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 a translation that didn't have probably enough um, oversight and and it actually feels less than worshipful or or maybe it feels uncomfortable even for for speakers and singers of a language uh, and we've also had some had we also have some examples of hymns that when translated in the other languages that are uh, that the translation becomes actually desperately incorrect uh, and so so the, these are some of the things we're trying to solve for in this in these next few years uh, and and we're trying to work out the challenges right now in a small handful of of languages that have the most church membership and so that we can apply those learnings to the other languages and and hopefully make them much quicker that's so interesting that whole process of uh, i remember looking at hymns on my mission and thinking man this is uh this is sort of a, a new viewpoint of this hymn. It sort of refreshed it for me because I had to really think about the the words I was saying and evaluate that. And I mean, putting that sort of announcement of accepting uh, so many submissions from around the world, a global church, did you notice any sort of cultural differences in the way a hymn would be written? For example, if you asked me to write a hymn, I would probably be very traditional, very... English poetic and sort of use perhaps archaic phrasing in my hymn writing but I, I have no idea if that would if someone from the Philippines was sending in a submission yeah th that was an interesting learning for me personally so this is not speaking for the church at all uh, I anticipated that that um, submissions would come from countries and cultures and that they would be hymns with um, in musical styles and approaches and lyrical styles and approaches that are local to church members throughout the world. We didn't really see that. Uh, rather, and and I was surprised, but in retrospect, less surprised, because if it it turned out that no matter where I live or where I come from, if I'm writing a hymn. I have in my mind what a hymn is supposed to be like, and that is largely influenced by the by the hymn traditions of Christianity, and 
and so so even though there were there were submissions from 60 countries most of those submissions uh seem familiar in terms of him writing style right i see yeah, we asked people from a few countries why this was the case and and uh i don't think this is generalizable to the church but but in the conversations that we've had uh the explanation goes something like this we love our cultural music our cultural music are not hymns they're they they're a different they serve a different purpose and we love that we also love the hymns we want to sing hymns in church and so so while that that's not conversation from everybody in the church or all over the world it does it has provided me some insight on that that may help explain some of why we didn't receive a a huge variance in stylistic approaches Mm -hmm. yeah that is interesting uh one of the other aspects of the uh, the announcement was the announcement for members to be able to submit hymns that they would suggest should be added to the hymn book that that are existing you know already in existence and uh, also suggestions to remove and uh, i'd i'd be interested as well to know uh, if members took up that challenge it sounds almost quite like a fun challenge uh, invitation but but also how how you decided similarly which ones you should uh, remove or or add in that were already existing. <laughs> so uh, we took that survey very seriously. There were twenty thousand responses, more or less, and um, and so the question is to to what extent did that survey influence downstream decisions, right? And, and the answer is uh, to varying degrees, uh, meaning uh, the committees that are assessing the hymns, the currently existing hymns, uh, did additional research to, to find out how much they're sung, sung in different countries. And sometimes the in, in some cases, the, uh, the survey results were confirming to what we found from different countries and sometimes in some cases the survey results were disconfirming uh, uh, so in, in other words there there are a number of songs that that uh, saints living on the Wasatch front just don't like to sing but in Central and South America it's one of the top 10 to 20 hymns uh, and, and so it and so we we try to to find some balance that way, and when we present the hymns to the uh, to the senior leaders of the church, we we try to share as full of a picture as we can. Um, one of the top you know, one of the top um, requests for inclusion inclusion in the hymn book was "Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing," and. And actually, since I began working for the church, that is certainly the top request. Why don't we have come thou found of every blessing? And and in reality, there are more than 500 hymns that the church currently publishes. Uh, the English hymn book has 341. Uh, but when you add in hymns that are in other languages that are not in English, that number boosts up to uh, over 500. And come thou fount of every blessing is in a number of them. Uh, so, so it was excluded from the 1985 hymn book after having been in the 1948 hymn book, uh, but it was included in, in some other languages. And uh, Michael Moody, who, who led the committee for the creation of the 1985 hymn book, has been interviewed several times uh, and asked often asked about that particular thing and his answer was that well when we made the 1985 hymn book it was pretty clear that congregations were not singing that hymn and we didn't know that Mac Wilberg was going to write an arrangement that was going to become wildly popular if we had we would have kept it in 
uh, and and really that is that is what has happened and uh, and it's become a, a hymn that we just we love it when the tabernacle choir sings it uh, and it it moves us quite universally everybody loves that so that that's one of the fun stories from that from that survey uh, amazing grace was another top one that that hasn't been included in our collections uh, that that again comes from your part of the world and we suspect that one would be a universal favorite as well right i see yeah that must have been uh interesting to see all the twenty thousand. uh I i'll say one of them was me i also contributed to that one but i can't remember what i put <laughs> i well, think i asked to get rid of uh in our lovely deseret or something like that one of the there, <laughs> one yes. was... that's a good example uh in in uh for for many english speakers that seems quite utah centric uh but that is one that's that's in the top most loved hymns in central and south america so <laughs> so it, and we don't really know why uh it but it just is and so those are the kind of things that are trying to be balanced as as we try to curate a collection that is that is the same in in every building in every uh, in every country. That's that's partly the beauty of of the church as well. Is wherever you are in the world, if you're traveling, you you feel at home, and and uh, I think that unification is beautiful. And uh, I know doing this is your work. You know, it's your profession. But I wondered if you had any favorite experiences that you've had during the process. Uh, of of doing the hymn book that's over the last few years. One of my favorite experiences was was um, considering what what the stylistic range might be for for new hymns and songs that could be included, and so uh, so we created a, a presentation intended for the senior leaders of the church uh, where we took in, I don't know, a small group of singers. I can't remember where there was eight, 12, something small. And, and the presentation, uh, in the presentation, we, we suggested this meeting is not about approving any of these hymns or songs rather it's about helping us understand where we cross the line on stylistic freedom. And so we're going to sing a, a range of, of new hymns that, that, that are coming from other traditions or coming from submissions. We're just going to sing a, a collection, a sampling, and we hope you'll tell us if there are if there are styles that you're uncomfortable with or uh, or that you want us to pursue more of. And and so we sang this really eclectic sampling of, of hymns. Some of them were quite contemporary hymns. Some were, um, um, some were African-American spirituals. Some were uh, just a, a whole range. And... And we, uh, we weren't trying to, we weren't trying to break the mold or anything. We just wanted to get a test. And, and at the end of the, at the end of the meeting, uh, the response was, well, you haven't crossed the line yet. And, and what, what we took out of that meeting was, was a real sense that the senior leaders of the, leaders of the church are quite in tune with the membership of the church. And that they love them and want them to be able to sing with joy and, and together and and that uh, I would describe them as quite progressive in their thinking and, and embracing of of what might be. I say that and and then I say in the end, 
we're going to have this collection of hymns and there are a lot of hymns that we're going to keep and it's and it's a limited collection so it's difficult for me to imagine that half the book is going to be new things because that would mean removing so many that we already have and love uh, but there will be some and it, and it'll be a meaningful i think it'll be a meaningful uh, refreshment of uh songs and hymns and and opportunities for worship mm -hmm. I, th I think that's a key thing you said at the end there of of having it be refreshing as we sing and sort of uh, I, I look forward to that first Sunday or the first few Sundays when when we have that new uh, collection of hymns and, you know, the novelty when when people look at those new hymns. But I, ob I also think despite that novelty, it will put into people's hearts that question of what we asked earlier on, which is why do we sing these hymns or, or what is the purpose? You know, we become so familiar with them that when we introduce a new one, or when there's a musical item, even currently in Sakura meeting, people think, oh, that that song was lovely. So uh, hopefully it will give that new, refreshed look and enhance people's worship. And uh, a quote that has been um, mentioned quite a few times in all the announcements and updates is, I believe, by President uh, Spencer W. Kimball about some of the greatest uh, hymns the church has produced are ones that have not yet been written I, I probably butchered that but but close to that and i wonder has, has that stood out to you as you've been going through thousands and thousands of hymns is hearing some that you think wow these are really on par with those iconic ones that we all love i think that has yet to be seen really because, and because it's I love the project and I've learned enough to know that I don't represent the world. Uh, and so I look forward to learning with everyone else and, and we will, uh, we're intended to begin publishing digitally, uh, some of these new things in just a few months. Uh, the exact date remains to be seen as we kind of work through the, the pipeline of publishing, uh, but it is it is months and and congregations, families, individuals will have a chance to to start looking at a few of these, using them in meetings, using them in their homes, and uh, and we hope we get feedback from it. Uh, whether it's oh thank you I've been hoping for something like this, or we sang this in our congregation and I've never heard such, or um, and on the other side, why would you think of doing this? I, I hope we get all kinds of feedback. What, what else can you say about the, the timeline of it? Uh, you, you've said there, which is quite exciting, that many of us or some of us will be getting it in months. Um, what, what does the rest of the, the project look like in terms of dates? Yeah, so um, I don't know that I can illuminate anything further than we had in the church news, but what it but what it will look like from um, from the perspective of someone in their home and in their congregation is uh, a few at a time will be published digitally, starting in a few months, and and they'll come at either regular or semi regular intervals, and uh, and then while those are while we receive feedback and learn from how people use those. Uh, we are completing the evaluation and approvals uh, such that we'll have a, uh, I anticipate that when we're, when the 12 and first presidency have approved the collection, it will be too big to fit in a book. And, and so then, I, then I think there will be a little, um, a short period of figuring out how to shrink that down to a publishable size uh, in order to get the first four languages uh, ready for 2026. And uh, we've been working on 
on models for a number of years on on how many books should be placed in a building. And uh, we've got a great team uh, of people on the publishing and distribution side working on how to answer those questions. Uh, so that, so just a lot of just a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of questions on the translation, printing, publishing, distribution side that that have been considered for a number of years. And so we're just coming to the answers as we get closer to the date. I'm sure everyone has on their mind the uh, <laughs> the nostalgic, the green with the the dark green with the black organ and stuff. Is there any sort of uh, clue as to as to if it will keep that similar look, or, or will we be getting something completely different? So there will be a, a uh, there's or I should say there's likely to be a little refreshed design uh we anticipate that these will that these books will will be a little larger uh, in page size uh, to make it a little to make it easier for um for playing as well as um as well as reading especially because a number of languages have uh text gain as we as they're translated and so a little bigger format will will make that more comfortable uh, the uh, I can't speak really on the design yet uh, but I wouldn't anticipate anything uh, what I would anticipate I should say is is that the hymns are are one of the core products of the church we have the scriptures and the hymns and those are those are key pieces, and then there, the the unit guides and handbooks, right? What what do we need to run the church at, at a minimum, and what are the key pieces of that? And uh, and so I, I would anticipate the new the new hymn collection to be um, to be very dignified, and and I expect it'll look like it belongs at the center of the church, uh, the church materials. With the scriptures thank you for that that's interesting and and i i appreciate your time today answering all my nosy questions about the project <laughs> and and uh i think uh i think a good way to close this off uh, and an appropriate way too would be to ask how you at the at the heart of this uh, project and having experienced it how have you ray felt the lord's hand in this project and and how has it impacted your faith uh, being a part of it? That's a good question and a hard, a hard question to answer completely. But, but I will say that it, at every step, it has been clear that it's, um, that the, the initial assignment was, oh, uh, was an opportunity to observe and witness revelation, the revelatory process by our prophets and apostles. Uh, the, the manager who has been over this project, his name is Steve Shank, and, and uh, we hired him prior to this project. Uh, but his whole, his whole background in professionally was uniquely tailored to be able to lead this in a uh, from a musical standpoint and also an ecclesiastical standpoint uh, this this uh, he leads these committees and it's really inspiring to me to see these spectacular experts give their best work and totally leave it, leave the decisions in, uh, in the hands of prophets and apostles and not advocate for, for the arts, not advocate for their particular viewpoint, but say, here's our best thinking. It's yours. 
We want it to be the Lord's. We expect your view on this to be the Lord's view and to represent that. And so here it is. Uh, that's inspiring to me. And and then the the as the decisions are made and uh, I see I see the revelatory process uh, in how in how church leaders discuss various various selections from the perspectives of of members that they've met throughout the world. I read these lyrics, I hear this song, and I think of this person or this family that that I met in in my travels. Uh, they are they are, I think, laser focused on ministering to Heavenly Father's children throughout the world. And I'm confident that this will be uh, both a reflection of that and an expression of how the hymns for the next period of time can lift us in our homes and in our readings at bringing us to a greater understanding of our Heavenly Father's love for us and and of his teachings and, and of the of the Savior's role in the whole plan. That's amazing. Thank you for coming on today, uh, Ray. I, I really appreciate it and uh, appreciate you. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm really glad to be with you, Ben. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for watching For All The Saints. This show needs your help to grow. Please like the video, comment your thoughts, subscribe to the channel and share this with someone you think would enjoy it. Thank you.